Hello, I'm Chip Pickering. I'm the CEO of Encompass, and I want to welcome everyone to the con con uh, continuation of our webinar series that we host on a on a regular basis, come rain, sleet, or snow, uh, especially this time of the year. And today I want to introduce uh, David Winch, who is going to, to lay out why data integrity and how to achieve data integrity, why it's so important. A three-part strategy for ensuring data integrity. He is the uh, Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Accent uh, Networks. He's a great member of Encompass. We uh, are grateful for him at our shows and just all the ways that he contributes to our community and the Encompass family. So thank you, David, and look forward to your presentation today. Well, thank you, Chip. Uh, Accent Networks is uh, happy to be able to have the opportunity to uh, to share this content today. And uh, we, we welcome all of you here today to talk about our three-part strategy for ensuring data integrity. Um, I will uh, introduce the, the rest of the panels here in a minute as we get going, but uh, let's just go ahead and, and kick off so you know what, what it is you're going to have today. Here, here is the agenda. Uh, following our introductions, we'll share with you the objective of this webinar, and we, we're going to highlight why should you care about data integrity, and then we want to help you assess your do-it-yourself option with respect to data integrity. And then we're going to provide you the step-by-step -step three part strategy for ensuring data strategy and go into next steps. Um, so a little bit about Accent Networks. As many of you may know, we, we like to view ourselves as a, as a company of telecom network engineers who just happen to become data integrity experts along the way. And, you know, we, we're all about happy happier, healthier networks. And the type of carriers we primarily work with are those that are struggling with inaccurate and incomplete BSS, OSS data, as you can read on the slide. Uh, some carriers we work with are committed to getting M&A due diligence right and meeting synergy targets. Uh, one of the other areas is those who are just tired of kicking the can on important but not urgent last mile reduction projects or other similar projects, or frustrated by a lack of resources to conduct TDM loop migration projects and challenged with service delivery backlogs and timely customer circuit design and activation. But today, we're here primarily to talk about those that are specifically re related to uh, data integrity. And the team of people here from Accent Network, uh, first of all, is the Vice President of Operations and Network Engineering, Kenny Dutton. Um, also is our, uh, one of the, the account managers and, and project program project managers is Greg Payne and our, uh, programmer data scientist in the data integrity area, Jared Rollins. Uh, so the meat of the conversation, uh, the, the three of them will be handling as we move forward today and I'll help facilitate. Uh, again, if you've got some questions, feel free to, uh, send those over for us to, uh, to see what questions you have along the way. And uh, we, we just look forward to having a, a good session with you today. So our objective today is to show you how to assess your do-it-yourself capabilities when it comes to achieving and maintaining data integrity. And to give you the step-by-step -step keys to successful data integrity so you can make 2024, the year you stop kicking the can when it comes to data integrity and clean up your data. Um, so again, these the idea is you'll have step-by-steps -steps on how to move forward with it, um, you know, on your own, or we also want to share with you some of the areas in which you may want to look for outside sources, such as Accent Networks, to get help on this project. So, um, Neil, why don't you go ahead and send out the poll? Um, we're curious in in your situation. You know what? It, why do you care? What is your? Uh, you know, uh, actually, it's the other question, Neilan. Um, we want the if you could change questions. There we go. 
The data integrity matters. That's it. All right. Um, if you guys go ahead and, and answer that, and uh, and and we'll we'll see what uh, which which direct or indirect cost due to bad data concerns you the most, um, and we'll look for your input. Um, whether it's paying for circuits you're not using, longer cycle times due to inaccurate in and I assignments, paying for unneeded IP blocks, inaccurate quotes, slowing down that process, or slow tech support responses. And if we look at it from a department level, you know, it, it might look like this. Here are some various areas in sales engineering or finance or engineering operations where different direct and indirect costs can end up mounting up as you take a look at data integrity issues. And Needlin, when you get the results of the poll, if you'd let us know. All right. So, um, Greg, Jared, the, the, the first thing we, we really want to share with the audience is just the whole process of assessing what is your data integrity need. Um, wh where would you like to start, Greg? Start at, let's start at the top. This slide is really about what do you need to do to uh, to assess your need. And, and there's three big questions I think that we ask or ask customers to ask as they as they look at their need. One is, is your data wrong? And, and we'll talk about this a little more in depth. Um, has a process changed uh, that renders your data invalid? Uh, all, all data integrity issues aren't necessarily mistakes. Sometimes you outgrow kind of your, your processes and systems. And, and the third big question is, can you compare your data across systems. Ultimately, what you want to be able to do is use the data you have and, and whatever means you're using it, whether it's from the finance side or the network side or anything in between, to, to be able to drive decisions. If you can't use your data to drive decisions, then um, then then you're missing out on a, on a powerful tool to, to run your business. So let's go by these step by step. First off, is your, uh, is your data wrong? And I'm going to uh, just have a little conversation with Jared and we'll go through some of these things. Jared, what, what do we mean when we say, is your data wrong? Well, essentially, uh, when we say, is your data wrong, is your data bad, um, that, that kind of depends on what your, what your business logic is, what your, what your rules are, what makes your data valuable to you. So, uh, you know, there are some generic things like, you know, data could be missing, data could be uh, just entered incorrectly with, you know, the fat fingers that happens. Um, uh, it could just be that uh, uh, for whatever reason, the data no longer helps you make a decision because it's 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 in, incorrect, but it kind of does the opposite. It, it makes you uh, make a bad decision or prevents you from making a decision at all. Sometimes it stops your process too, right? As you have to, as the uh, the worker has to stop down and, and go find out what's really going on. We talked before too about how sometimes your data is outdated. You have data in there, but it's not up to date. And if it's not up to date, that doesn't that doesn't do you really much good. Jared, let me ask you this. You know, we worked with uh, Jared and I run a lot of these projects that that Accent does. How how uh, well do you think customers are able to assess the status of their data, whether it's good or bad? Well, you know. It varies. You know, we've, we've had some clients that are very, very good at it. We've had some clients that uh, not so much. Uh, one in particular that comes to mind is, you know, they told us, uh, you know, the project was a kind of a reconciliation project where we wanted to try to make sure that inventory and their billing systems were were meshing. And they said, oh, you know, we, we believe that we're 85% of the way there. We need you to help get us across the finish line. But once we actually began the analysis process, that 85% flipped and it was more like 58. So, it, it, you know, the, uh, the challenge is just a lot of times with that assessment, being able to accurately detect, you know, how bad the data is. Yeah, that one was just a circuit comparison, right? Network data to uh, inventory, what they thought they were managing. I think our customers usually know they have a problem. They don't always know how bad the problem is. Sometimes they're, and, and rarely are they surprised at how good it is. It's usually worse than, than they expect. And it can be bad in, in a lot of ways, like Jared said, sometimes it's just bad and, and you know it, it's, it's just wrong. Sometimes it's outdated. Sometimes you're missing key pieces. 
you may have the customer right, the site right, but you may be missing uh, key, p- key pieces like uh, like VLAN information or or uh, IP information. Uh, I know, Kenny, you've got a story about a customer that had some some issues with IP rec, uh, with IP reclamation due to just missing components or, or components that weren't uh, managed well because the needs of the business changed. Do you want to talk about that a little bit, Kenny? Yeah, I think a lot of times when we talk about this subject, data integrity specifically, we talk a lot about circuits and, excuse me, we don't typically talk a lot about all the other problems related to bad or invalid or inaccurate data. Um, some of those, some of those, re- the reality is, is that there are a lot of other things that that this bad data has impact on. For example, IPs, we have, you know, a large customer that has a, a massive volume of IPs that they're no longer able to use because they, they don't know where they reside. They don't know what IPs they have. So going and reclaiming IP blocks is a big thing. Uh, addresses is a, is a big deal. Uh, we, and we don't always talk about that. Uh, the other things that are big deals are like lit building lists. I know uh, the poll suggested that everybody here really does care a lot about circuits that are no longer in use. Uh, and that that's kind of why we're, we we talk about circuits so frequently, but there are, there are the list of things goes on and on and on uh, related to, bad data, for example, space and power. Uh, we have we have old equipment out there in the network that's using up space and power that no longer supports any of our TDM services. And, and yet it's still out there taking up space, it's taking up power. Not to mention, we also have, uh, we're buying equipment off the black market for end of life uh, equipment that's sitting out there in, in, in these spaces. So Circuits is a big concern, and and it's always the low low hanging fruit, but it, it doesn't always cover everything that's out there that that's opportunity to be recognized in in a bad data environment. Yeah, good. Hey, good great, point, great, great, great. Let's have everybody uh, for for the for some of you that have not yet answered the poll. If you could go ahead and quickly answer the data integrity matters poll, and then we, we've got uh, another poll coming after this one. So if you uh, those who haven't, if you'd answer this one, and then we'll set up the next poll. Go ahead, Greg. No, I was going to say, that's great. You, know, you probably know if your data is wrong on some level because you deal with the pain pain of it in your day-to-day business. You may not know uh, you may not know how bad it is unless you really do a, a, a good assessment. Um, and, and I figure you probably know because you're on this call, right? You feel a need. Uh, and if you do, you're not alone. Again, our, our big encouragement here is let, let this be the year that you do something, that you start taking some steps to, to stop the bleeding and make things better. Uh, a second reason or a second assessment question is, is one, maybe your processes are, are, are good, but your business is changing. And so you need to ask yourself, has a process change that, um, that renders your data invalid or that changes the needs of your business in terms of what data you need to provide, where you need to provide it, and how you need to hand it off? Um, Jared, when we talk about this one, process changes, what kind of process changes um, are we talking about that may, may impact the company and, and, and their needs and how they handle their data? Could be any number of things. Um, uh, processes change all the time. We know that, right? So it could be that uh, there was a decision that was made on high that gets it gets filtered down. And uh, that means that we'll start collecting different data or we'll start changing the way data is collected. So that could affect uh, data integrity. Uh, there's also uh, the chance that maybe technology has changed. Uh, we start, you know, you, you get a new piece of software. Uh, this software is bigger and better. And so the way that data is input uh, may may be different than what we're used to, and that may uh, cause some data inconsistencies. Um, maybe a workflow changes. You know, who's inputting data might change. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it may uh, play a big part in uh, what gets collect- gets collected or how it gets collected. And as those workflows change, or maybe as software changes, uh, it, it introduces um, issues. For instance, uh, have I'm sure many of you have seen uh, a software system that introduces something that's a required field, but when someone's going through their workflow, they don't have that required information. So you may see XXXX9999 um, uh, throughout your data um, because, you know, the workflow needs to go on, but the data integrity portion of it is left behind. There's probably a good assessment you could do by seeing how many uh, data entries of multiple nines do you have in your network. We could probably build an index based on that, I think. I was thinking, Jared, of those of us who've been around a while, just how we've seen uh, the needs of of the business change in terms of data as the the industries move from GSM to Ethernet. 
And there's been so many changes on what you need to capture, how you need to capture it, and how you need to relate it and, and to, to use that data well. Uh, another area I was thinking about, Jared, in, in a process change, uh, I think we know a story of a, of a company who um, who had tools and systems, a, a mix of homegrown and, and off-the-shelf systems to manage everything from cradle to grave, from their, their sales cycle to uh, managing inventory to uh, accounts payable and billing and, and, and sales bonuses. They had you know, this entire ecosystem together and, 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 uh, and they outgrew it. Do you wanna talk about that a little bit and how that might change your, your needs and how you, um, how you use your data? Oh yeah, um, you know, it happens all the time. Uh, uh, maybe there's homegrown systems, maybe there's a, a, paid, a paid version of some software, but um, sometimes you, you outgrow those needs maybe hopefully i don't i don't offend anyone but maybe there's just this this great job we're doing in excel and um uh excel excel everyone loves excel it's good you know i, I don't hate excel i love it but uh <laughs> it it um it's good for for a certain thing right and oftentimes it gets used as something else but, um, you know, you have all these systems. And with this particular company that you're talking about, they had a very, very good system. It worked for them. But they started realizing that the integrity of the data uh, wasn't uh, where it needed to be. And so they were moving on to something better. They realized that, um, hey, this is, this is not something we can handle on our own. So we're, we're going to have to bring someone in to help us to ease this transition from uh, one system to the next. And oftentimes that's, that's the way it works. You, you get into a situation where, you know, you've just, your software just is not working for you. It's got to, it's got to be updated. Uh, it's got maybe different data fields. Uh, the fields that uh, you're moving into require different format, different formats or different formatting. Um, there's just a whole lot of things that may, uh, you know, be necessary to do in order to get data from one old system into a new one. And so that's that's what happened in that case. Yeah, true. Hey, let's be honest about Excel. You like it. I like Excel. You like it if I'm using it. You don't like it if you need to use it. <laughs> I like it as long as you don't use it as a database. There you go. That? How about that's that? That's true. True. The third question is, is, is this, and can you compare your data across systems? Does your data flow and work for you as you're trying to, to compare it from uh, inventory data, your network data, your accounts data? Uh, can you use it to, to make key decisions about your business, to assess the health of your business, uh, to assess trends? Um, and, and here we're talking about a, a number of things. Sometimes you, you run into problems just because of the, of the nature of your business. Um, uh, Jared, we we worked with one customer who, who they had they had needs and they knew it. They knew they had data problems, and it was because they had a, a bunch of mergers and acquisitions. And with each merger and acquisition, they developed they they bought a new ecosystem of uh, of kind of a data architecture. And 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 then they faced the challenge of how do I bring that together? Uh, do you want to talk about that one a little bit and the challenges that 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 presented? Yeah, uh, that one was a very challenging because, well, like you mentioned, many many uh, sources of data. From all these acquisitions, um, some of them newer databases, some of them old, older, terminal-based databases, some of them spreadsheets, CSV files, uh, just different sources of information, and um, that was that was uh, similar to the you know you know you've got a real bad plumbing problem you know how you know I I know it's bad maybe I can kind of fix it myself but you start looking at you know, all the water that's collected and you start looking at all the, you know, all the pipes and you say, you know, I, I, I can't do that one on my own. So it, it turned out with them, you know, there was just a, there was just so much information that needed to be collected and aggregated. Uh, it, it became a situation where, uh, you know, they had to bring in, bring us in to help with, with, um, uh, making sure that the data was was accurate as they as they brought it together. Yeah. In short, like in summary for this slide, you know you have a need. I mean, you know probably if your data is wrong, you may not know how bad or how good it is. Um, even if you're doing everything right now, our, our industry is so dynamic. Things change, processes change, tools change, opportunities to, to make improvements or introduce automation or APIs into your network are there to make, your, make yourself more efficient or to cut costs or to, to speed up your delivery. Um, those are those are needs. That's the data integrity need. And then, can you use your data across multiple systems to make good decisions uh, about your business? So, 
that's that's basically your assessment questions. All right. So anybody again uh, that the poll, I think Neil still has it open as far as your data integrity need. Uh, it looks like about half of you have answered so far. So if you want to go ahead and answer that, and we'll close that poll out shortly. Uh, as we, um, you know, assessing the data integrity need. You know, the next part has to do with just assessing the do-it-yourself options. So, um, Greg, you want to go ahead and lead the way there? Yeah. So, all right, you know you have a problem. Now the next question is, all right, what do you do about it? And, again, our encouragement is make this the year you do something. If there is some of this you can do yourself. No one knows your network and your business better than you do. Um, how much can you do yourself and, and where do you need a partner to come and help? Maybe you can do all of it. Maybe, maybe not, but here are the kind of the key questions you need to ask. What, what capacity do you have to take on a, a data integrity project? Uh, do you have the skills in house? You certainly have the knowledge. Uh, do the folks with the skills and knowledge have, a, have, have the availability or are they tied down with other responsibilities? So you can't stop the business down to do these projects and, and they are, um, they are messy. You know, you're going to get into you're going to get into the mud a little bit as as you as you kind of go down this path. Um, do you have the desire to do it? Uh, you know, are you OK Maybe for, for some of you where you're at in, in your business? You can live with the way things are and you can you can kind of deal with band-aids and, and shortcuts and, and ad hoc processes for now. Um, but at some point, you know, it, it'll need to be addressed. My favorite um, my favorite quote kind of related to this topic is from John Wooden, the famous UCLA basketball coach. And he said, if you don't have time to do it right, when will you have time to do it again? And it's just really a, an encouragement to, um, to stop living with things that aren't going well and, and, and fix them. Um, and, then, and then the last kind of big question is timing. Is it, is it the time, is the time right for your business to, to invest in cleaning up your data? You may be moving so fast and have other priorities where it's not the right time. Or, or maybe what you can do is just really small. Um, and, and that's okay. You know, all those things are okay. But you need to make a, a good assessment of how um, how willing and able and capable you are of, of taking on this project and how far you want to go with it. And, and then where do you need help? Because these, these really are partnership projects. You know, if you engage with a company like us or someone else. All right. So we've, we've talked about assessing, you know, the need for data integrity. And we also walked through the assessing whether it makes sense to do it yourself or go outside. Um, now, Greg and Jared can kind of walk us through the step-by-step -step process so, so that if you want to do it yourself or at least start on it yourself, what are the steps to follow? What are the things to do? And they're going to outline for you what, what it is you need to do to achieve and maintain data, good data integrity. Yeah, so this is what we do. Our three steps are uh, discovery and reconciliation step. Uh, an optimization step that's really focused on process, particularly inputs and handoffs, and then a, a continual improvement uh, quality step um, that, that you're running post post project. So um, next slide, David, you want to go to the next one? We'll start All right, we'll dig this. in. We'll dig into the first one and just encourage people if you, as Greg and Jared going through, if you've got any questions on any of these three steps, uh, you know, please fire away the questions. Uh, in the Q&A area. Go ahead, Greg. First big step, and, and there's always more to these, but these are the basic things. You gotta do your, your, your kind of your data validation, assess your, your data architecture. Uh, what are your data sources? How many places are you getting data from? And then they may be systems, they may be people, they may be emails, it could be any number of things, but you have to identify the sources of your data. And then, and then once you've done that, then then you need to determine uh, what's your uh, what's your source of truth. Jared, what do we mean when we talk about data a data source of truth? Uh, just you know what um, uh, you know for your for your business, uh, what are the uh, the sources that uh, matter the most? Uh, oftentimes, uh, many many uh, of our clients will have multiple sources that were created for maybe different departments and different uh, organizations will have uh, different ways of kind of managing what their what their data sources are. Uh, they could they could be you know databases or um, trackers of some kind spreadsheets, um, but um, you, you know we want to dial it back to what are your essential sources of truth the things that feed all those trackers and all those uh, uh, 
you know, ancillary databases, um, you know, those original sources of truth are usually the ones that have to be addressed in order to, to get everything else in line. Jared, I think about it this way. When you think about like a circuit ID, you have circuit IDs housed in multiple places. If they, if they don't match or if they conflict, which one do you trust? What are you going to, to, to find the, you know, to find the answer to, or which one are you saying is, is the source of truth? So, you know, that's a, that's an important question to know because that's the key for your, your reconciliation. How close can you get to the truth? Your source of truth is the baseline you're going to measure everything else against, right? Your network data, your invoice, your billing, your, um, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, so once you have that, you know, your sources, you kind of put an order of priority on those sources uh, related to your different data points. Then you need to, then you need to prep your data to really run a good analysis. And this might be the part where you need some expert help. That's in the, the data cleansing or the, the data uh, sanitizing. Um, Jared, do you want to talk about that a little bit? What is that process like? I know it's your favorite part. Yes, this is where this is usually where we have to leave Excel, and right. we're not, and we're not uh, dealing with uh, VLOOKUPs and and uh, formulas anymore. But uh, really, a, a more involved process of making sure the data is clean according to you know the needs of your business. Um, so you know our address is stored properly. Um, do you need a a valid address, or is the corner of uh, at the top of a pole in 49th and Main Street is that sufficient? You know, depending on your your needs of your business, uh, are circuit IDs correct? Are they stored with dots or slashes or uh, whatever system uh, the system requires? Um, if you're reading data for perhaps like from uh, using OCR on a in a PDF file that you extract from an email, uh, is it is it gathering that information correctly and in the format that it should be? So all these types of things are just ways of making sure that the data is clean from your perspective, uh, it's sanitized, and it's uh, ready to be a proper source of truth. Depending on the size of your your data set, some of our customers have done this well, and they can they can strip circuit IDs, pull all the extra characters out, so they can do comparisons. IPs usually aren't too hard because there's not a lot of extra characters. Um, you know, the, some of this you you can do, but once you start getting into larger data sets or more complicated pieces of data addresses in particular, then uh, then you need to run this if you're going to do some like for like comparisons. You know, once we've done that, then then we're going to run an analysis, and basically we're running an analysis. Uh, based on your needs, and, and, and these projects are run from different perspectives. It may be a, a network-driven perspective. Uh, does our inventory um, system match the network? It may be finance-driven, trying to discover um, cost or cost you can reduce or revenue that you can recover. Uh, you know, then we'll run our analysis and come up with a, with a score and say, hey, you're X percent okay on your main data point, on your circuit IDs, uh, your billing uh, data matches by uh, seventy five percent, your UDAs, you know, we might break them out by uh, by your key fields. Your IP addresses are ten percent, or they're ninety percent. Your VLANs, you know, and so on and so forth. Whatever is important to you, um, that's what you're trying to do. You need that baseline because that's your that's your starting point. The great thing about these projects, I think, is is that you can see progress along the way once you have a baseline. You've got a starting number, and as you rerun those baseline numbers after you make improvements, you can see the improvement. And you know you're not just improving a number that shows up on a PowerPoint, you're improving the flow of your business and you're improving quote to cash and you're cutting costs. You know, you're making your data better so folks, not just you, but folks across your business can, can make good decisions. We run an, an iterative process from there. Uh, we review the baseline and then we start making we start making changes, we start making fixes, make the obvious ones first, and they may be format changes. You know, we start making big bulk corrections. Uh, and, and then we start bringing people in to, to look at the, at the fallout. Um, a lot of this process is, is programmatic on the front end, but you can't escape the need for people who know your business and who know the technology to go in and do research. There's no, I haven't yet to see anybody who's got a magic programmatic solution. The, the last mile or the last two miles of any of these projects involves people doing hard work, people who know things uh doing hard work you need people here to do that so what we'll do is as someone goes in and they find maybe a, a pocket of a, of a scenario that's causing some mismatches 
uh, maybe with a particular vendor in a particular area, we'll fix them. We'll take those back to Jared and then he will build that into the programmatic approach. We'll run the baseline again with improved results and we'll continue to chip away at that over and over again until we can bring that uh, match number uh, up as high as we as high as we can reasonably get it. Is there anything else? Did I leave out anything regarding to the the iterative process? No, I think you I think you nailed it. Um, that that um, that process is what's important, you know, to 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 drive those results. And like you mentioned, uh, a lot of that is programmatic, um, but uh, that last that last effort. Um, usually is a manual effort to be able to go in and fix things. And, you know, that's a, that's the, you know, the, 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 the real nitty gritty part of it, that last, that last few percentage yeah. points. And Kenny can attest to some of these projects. At some point you get to a certain point and what you have left, Kenny, right, is so small that maybe it's not worth pursuing anymore. We've certainly run into that a few times, right? Yeah, a lot of times we think that we want to, you know, customer think that they want to try to achieve a 99.5% match rate or a 99% match rate or even a 95% match rate. And sometimes getting to 95% means while, while Greg mentioned this is dirty and it's there's no magic, um, it gets even more dirty. Uh, the less valuable a circuit is if you're looking at circuits specifically. And when those circuits get down to the, you know, where they're $5 a circuit or $7 a circuit or $12 a circuit or even $20 a circuit, sometimes you don't want to put in that extra effort to, to go and realize that one extra point of match based on the return on investment. Uh, sometimes you just get to the point of diminishing returns. Yeah. Good. Next slide, David. All right. This is what we've labeled this as a part two, but really this is going on concurrently with part one and, and, and you, you have to have an eye to your process as you're going through this. So there's a reason why you have issues, right? And, and it's, it's process related, whether it's um, processes that are undocumented or things that are not covered or handoffs that aren't, aren't clear or consistent or, or just the, the growth of your business has, has changed what you do. So you always have to have a, a, an eye out on, on your inputs. You want to optimize your inputs and you want to optimize your hand your handoffs. The first part of that is, is you really need to start thinking about implementing a, a, a data governance framework, standardizing formats, resolving your, your naming inconsistencies and in, in, in eliminating um, eliminating redundant entries. Jared, when we talk about data governance, what's most important here to you? Yeah, so we talked previously about cleansing our data, sanitizing it, um, sanitizing existing data, but as you, you work through the, the workflow and you continue this iterative process, you start that garbage in, garbage out, pro, you know, thing that goes on where you don't want to keep muddying the waters as you go along. So it's good to have a some sort of framework in place that governs the data uh, as its input. It could be a process that gets uh, built uh, out, or it could be a uh, a way of enforcing it in the software um, so that things are entered correctly, uh, maybe just training, you know, different things that just help to um, be make sure that that information, uh, your data is not returning to its previous state. Because once the initial baseline is run, you start to work on that and that project is complete. Now you've got another one. Yeah, that has to start. So you want to really um, think about, you know, beforehand, we talked about how sometimes processes change, maybe software is introduced. And but if you think about beforehand, how's that going to change my data? Then we start to see how it's important with the, with uh, uh, data governance frameworks that that keep that data from getting too bad in the first place. This is things everybody I think can do now. If you have a process that is kind of forcing people to to fill out a field with with uh, with nine 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 because they need to move it on, they need to move the process on, and they don't have the data, then this is a great chance to reevaluate reevaluate your process and 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 set it up so they either they have the correct data or that data is not required until a later step. And I know we talk a lot too about. Um, the bane of all these projects is is open fields, a field where you can put in anything, and, and they're not they're not requiring a standard format, or they're not limiting the number of characters to what that field requires, or they're not uh, there's not a pick list or a, a address validation check as you're entering data. You know, the more open it is, the more more problems you have. If you can standardize that data and you can standardize the inputs, 
to make it easier for the the person entering it, then um, then you can eliminate a lot of your data integrity problems going forward, right? The next step of that is, is then process improvement. You, you want to look at your processes. Are, are you doing things over and over again? Do you have a lot of swivel chair where you receive information and then you have to manually input it, cut and paste into another system? Um, are your handoffs clean? Is the data coming to, to your group uh, coming ready for you to execute or do you, have to, do you have to push it back? And then are you sending things forward to the next group? in a manner where it, where it can be moved. If not, then 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 it's worth taking a good look at your processes and, and cleaning them up so those handoffs are clean and they're just happening once. You're getting the info you need and you're passing on the info you need so that so that you can um, so that you can move on. There's also Jared so many tools I think now um, where before there used to you used to have to swivel chair or cut and paste. I know we we used to build a lot of scripts little small scripts, keyboard scripts in the old days to cut and paste information from one screen to another uh, or maybe even different uh, screens within a tool. I know Kenny's done this a lot too back in the old days. Um, now there's so many tools available to, to push data across systems. How, how, do those, how have those impacted the work we do, Jared? Oh. Think about APIs and, and things like that. Oh, oh, very much. You know, you know the, uh, the eliminating of... of uh manual error as much as possible always helps with data integrity and so you know taking advantage of the the, uh, uh, the electronic tools that are out there to to help with uh, uh, with that is is key uh, take advantage of automation uh, using uh, apis when when uh, appropriate to to be able to uh, extract data without any middleman being able to to interfere with it uh, things like that really, really help to uh, ensure that the data, uh, you know, in our sources of truth, main, maintain their integrity. Kenny's been a big proponent of this thing for us here and how we do our work of trying to build little uh, RPAs, little robotic processes for folks to do their work, right, Kenny? And, and then even empowering folks to, to understand some of the tools available, even at the user level, um, to speed up work or to ensure accuracy or to, or to script, basically short script um redundant repetitive processes and and uh kenny that's a big deal isn't it that helps quite a bit yeah touching on what jared said you know anytime you can eliminate human error right let's call it what it is anytime you can eliminate human error by pulling information from one system to another via api or populating information without somebody having to swivel chair that there's always a benefit in that uh you know even the free text fields that greg re referred to earlier some of the free text fields that are available that should only be available i think in space where you're trying to put comments and even in comments i don't think you should type free free text i think that you know when we put comments in in, in a workflow tool uh we want to standardize those comments and we want we don't want someone typing those comments because we're going to use those comments to do reporting later to identify and, and look for opportunity uh so if we have uh if, if we script those and have uh, exact comments that we're able to populate without somebody typing, we can use that to our benefit down the road for, for reporting and different different purposes. So Those scripted comments too are, are great because then you can come up with a verbiage that communicates the situation because it happens, you know, you're always running just the same few scenarios over and over again in your comments. That helps quite a bit as well, right? There's so much to, to a data integrity project and a lot of it is, is, is tied closely to processes. Again, there's a lot of things that you can do. It may not fix the problems you've had in the past, but if you can kind of stop the bleeding by um, standardizing your formats and then tightening data entry where you need to, and, and then even improve your processes with uh, in small ways with little scripts or APIs or uh, Power BI scripts, or there's so many tools available at the user level now uh, that, that, can help you, that can help you so much. The impact is, is really, really big. Right. Part three, David. The last part's the final step. Jared's already alluded to this. Uh, what a shame if you uh, if you go through this effort and, and it is an effort and you get in the mud and and you um, clean your data up, but you don't um, you don't update your processes to stop the bleeding. And, and what a shame if you don't leverage all the work you did to 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 build a good monitoring program, a quality uh, assessment program for your data. Here's where, where you're basically um, asking the questions again. You, you've got tools and reports now. Uh, if we're doing it for you, we hand the reports to you. You can run them or we can come in and run them at, uh, at a quarter at, at the six month mark or once a year and, and kind of see how things are going. And you're asking the same questions you asked in the assessment. Is your data bad? How, how does it look? It was 95% when the project ended. Is it still 95%? Is it trending up? Is it trending down? 
uh, and, and look at your key fields as well. Uh, completeness, is anything missing? Have the processes changed or something in your business changed uh, where you're capturing everything you need to capture or are there gaps? Um, because our, our again, our industry is dynamic. Things change often and our needs for our data change often or a tool might change. Um, so, you know, you're still asking that process question and the consistency are your processes and people aligned and, and that has to do with your handoffs or your handoffs good. Are they done well? Are they actionable? And can you compare your data across across your uh, across your various systems? Can you compare it? And, and, and does the universe look the same from whatever perspective you're looking at, whether it's finance, whether it's sales, whether it's network or, or anything else? I mean, ultimately, what you want, you want to be able to use your data to make good decisions uh, about your business, whether that's day to day or, or long term strategic things. So that that's basically it. That's our three part process. That's what we do. That's what we want. And that's what we encourage you to, to start. You can do a lot of it yourself. If you need help, uh, there's help, there's help available to you. Um, David, I'll turn it over to you for the kind of for the wrap. Okay. And again, we encourage. So uh, whatever questions you had, I mean, you, you, you signed up for this uh, webinar for a reason. You, you, there was something you were curious about or whatever. And, uh, you know, if we haven't addressed it at this point, if you could simply ask that question, whether we can address it now or follow up later, we'll do that. Uh, but but really, the next steps of, you know, of what we uh, what we encourage is make 2024 a year that you stop kicking the can when it comes to data integrity and clean up your data. And, and as we've talked about, it's understanding how bad is your data integrity problem and you know, how much of it do you want to do yourself versus getting outside help? You know, and if you're, you know, first of all, getting that help and assessing the problem. Um, as as Jared talked about earlier, you know, we frequently have people coming in saying it's 85, they're 85% accurate. And how, how many times it turns out it's really closer to 58% accurate. Um, so, I mean, that's that's one of those things that we, come across a lot. And so first of all, just being able to dig into what is the size of the problem and, and understanding that, and then just what helped you need with the process of as far as, you know, as Greg had talked about earlier, from a capacity point of view, you know, do you have the skills and available to do it? And of, with the people who have the skills, are they available to work on it? What are the other requirements? And, you know, is is it a good time for you to do it yourself or is it a good time to have somebody else come in? And, and as we've, you know, they've alluded, this can be a messy project. So the, the question ends up being, um, are they, uh, is it something maybe you want somebody coming in from the outside to help you with? But um, again, Jared and Greg and Kenny, thank you very much for everything you've, you've shared to this point. Uh, and we're, we're here to address any other questions that you may have now or in the future. All right. I'm not seeing any questions coming in yet here, Neilan or Chip. I'm not sure what that says, but uh, um, Chip, thank you for the, again, the opportunity for us to be here. We appreciate every everybody being here today and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Well, David, it was a great presentation from you and all your team. Uh, very thorough. Uh, it's a good way to start the new year, uh, getting your house in order, getting your data um, in order, and to, to do the things that are difficult, difficult, uh, but will pay great dividends in the in the future. So I appreciate uh, again Accent Networks, all the the good work that you do for many of our uh, businesses and companies that are part of Encompass. And we thank you for the webinar today. All right. Craig Maloof, has, we do have a question that said, okay. has asked to talk about a use case that we've helped with recently. Um, so, um, Greg, or Jared, do you want to talk about a couple of the ones that we're working on right now? Oh, man, we have a few. I'm not, I'm not even sure where to start. You know, what we're, what we're seeing more and more, Craig, is we're seeing more and more uh, requests for help with IPs with IP network and, 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 and uh, command and control or, or maintenance of your IP network or understanding where your IPs are, where they're used, which ones can be recovered. Um, uh, and, and also uh, questions about help with how to, uh, how to manage that process of tying your IPs to, 
to specific customers. We're in the in the middle of, of a few of those. And with some, they've been quite lucrative in, in the sense that we've been able to recover IP blocks for customers that they've been able to go and 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 reuse instead of having to buy new. And um, Kenny, you've heard a lot of those questions, right? There's a lot of those out there where uh, those are assets for you, right? Those IP blocks are assets. And if you can recover them um, and, and either, and either um, liquidate them or, or reuse them, those are, uh, that, that has a big impact on your business. Yeah, certainly an option for both liquidation of those IP blocks, IPv4 blocks specifically is, is a thing that we've, we've done for some customers where they're taking those and, and selling those assets instead of leaving them stranded in the, in the, in the, in their network. Yeah. We still get a lot of the classic stuff too, though, right? Which is just, Hey, we know we have, I, we know we're paying for circuits that are not in use. We'd like to cut the costs. I mean, that's still the heart of, of these projects. That's uh, and, and I think that's probably because those projects present a business case. That's easy to understand. If you invest so much, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get savings and savings that compounds over time. Well, I think, Greg, one of the other problems that that we hear about out there in the marketplace that we've done some work on in the past, I don't know if we're currently working on one, but you know, I mean, there's a lot of people that are still trying to clean up data because, you know, with the with the changes, um, you know, in the cost structures, um, you know, for for old old technology and everything of that sort, there's there's a lot of people that are still cleaning up some of those projects to take care of some of the old technology stuff, anything you want to talk about as far as that specific problem that some of the people in the marketplace have or want to deal with because of the, the changes in regulations? There's definitely some of that. There's definitely folks who want to turn down some of that old business, that, that old technology and, and shed it. Cause it, you know, Kenny's alluded to some of this already. You shed not just screen dollar costs, you shed your gray dollar, you shed um, some space and, and power costs and, and associated maintenance costs and, um, Parts and equipment costs, and um, and and there's definitely folks out there that are that are pursuing that quite heavily, especially in in uh, in the economy we're in. If you can cut costs, you know that's a great um, that's a great way to build margin in your business, not just for now, but you know again that comp it compounds over time, month over month. Any other questions out there, or Craig? Anything you want to follow up on that question? You want to dig deeper? Okay. Um... All right. Very good. Thank you, Craig. Um, I guess uh, one other shout for additional questions from anybody they have. Uh, I, I mean, in, any area you were, I guess the other part is if there's an area you were looking for answers for that, that you didn't hear stuff, you know, we'd be happy to, you know, if it's something we can follow up on, we'll follow up on. If you want to share that information, that'd be great. Um, Jared, can you think of anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we go? I, I don't have anything else. All right. Kenny? No, I'm good. Thank you. Greg? Yeah, make this the year. Just make this the year. Make this the year. Any All right. Stuff is helpful. Well, very good. Well, um, uh, we, we appreciate everybody being here. We And uh, we, we hope you were able to to get get a nugget or two out of this and and that you can as Greg says make this the year to you know work on that data integrity <laughs>